Hi, my name is Charlie Fink. I cover XR uh, for Forbes, and I've written several books on the topic. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, several colleagues who you'll meet in a second to talk about the effects of the pandemic and how it has ha impacted our businesses, or I should say our business. Now, you know, some of us are in the conference business, and as we know, many conferences are being canceled around the world, uh, as well as sporting events, other live gatherings. So I think there's a real question of, you know, where, where are those, you know, conferences going to go, both in the near term and the long term. But I think we want to limit our conversation to just talking about uh, online conferences, because what we're really talking about is remote collaboration and how we're going to do business in the future and what role virtual worlds are going to have in that. So I'll, I'll start with you, Chance, if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how the crisis is impacting your company. Yeah, th thank you, China Xiu. Uh, I'm James from NVIDIA. I'm responsible for the China business based in Beijing. Uh, I think everybody knows I mean, the coro uh, coronavirus. The most, I mean, the biggest impact in China is uh, China is uh, the first country hit by the virus. And uh, I, I'm sure we know a lot of, I mean, the conference, global conference, especially, I mean, the uh, canceled or push, 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 postponed to, uh, to maybe second half of the year. But uh, most of the large conference in the first half uh, almost canceled. Including uh, we everybody knows that uh, FWC, the DDC in San Francisco, uh, and also on the, even our GTC <clears throat> as well. And so, what about South by Southwest and Coachella? <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So 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 you can see like that almost a, a global conference should be thinking a new way, how can we uh, organize the large conference globally? And look at I mean, the, some of the, uh, some of the uh, examples we can take a reference, for example, like uh, Genova, they have the auto show, right? I, th I thought I mean, the auto show, suppose I mean, the Genova auto show should be in the beginning of the March, um, but they cancel it. But a lot, of, a lot of OEMs, the automakers, they think about a lot of creative way to do their own program launch based on new technology. So, but, but the first of the things is everybody's thinking about everything should be online and digital. And they think about a lot of uh, uh, trade shows or product, review, uh, product announcement based on a line, uh, uh, online live streaming. So you can introduce globally. And uh, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a typical point to change our behavior to think how how we can do things, I mean, without a large conference, uh, get a people physically, I mean, uh, uh, together. So that's, I think that's a be, uh, could be disruptive of a way, but it's a new way of, of creative ways to doing uh, business for everyone. Uh, great, thank you, Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew Ferguson. I'm the co-founder and COO of Brain Exchange. Um, Brain Exchange, organizes world-class emerging technology events currently focused in uh, XR and wearables. Um, you know, we, the, the three events that we have this year are AWE USA, um, you know, Brain Exchange is the producer behind AWE USA uh, and AWE EU. Uh, and then we also have um, EWTS. So both AWE EU and EWTS are in the fall, AWE USA is coming up in the end of May. Um, fortunately, in the past, AWA has used live stream in tandem with the in-person event. Um, they haven't in the most recent two years, but we, you know, we have much earlier than that. So we actually had a little bit of a head start. We have experience in kind of thinking on this subject. So, you know, unlike a lot of the major events, um, you know, like MWC and uh, Coachella, any of these like big, big events have had very little time to plan. So we're in a little bit of unique scenario. I mean, we're under three months, but it's not like we had to make a decision in two weeks, uh, like some of the events that have had to cancel. Um, so in addition to that, we're bringing back, uh, for obvious reasons, a digital 
uh, version, we're announcing AWE Digital within the next seven days. Um, oh. So we're really doing some pretty awesome stuff. Um, don't uh, imagine digital fully taking over live uh, for AWE or for really any of our events. We, we see it as uh, in tandem, um, improving the experience. Uh, what we've really found is um, it's, it's really difficult to recreate the hallway conversation um, in a digital environment. Um, but we are coming up with very unique ways of, of accomplishing an alternative to that that we think is equal. We'll talk a little bit more about that because um, how you introduce the nuance of the serendipity makes conferences so important is um, critical to making the uh, virtual, uh, equi you know, the virtual conference as equally satisfying and attractive. Hi, Blair. Hey, Charlie. So I'm uh, Blair McIntyre. I'm have a variety of impacts in this. So I'm a professor at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I also am a research scientist at Mozilla. And uh, most relevant to this, I'm one of the co-chairs of the IEEE VR conference, which is you know big academic VR conference that's coming up in Atlanta. Well, not in Atlanta uh, at the end of the month. So actually, when this airs, it will be starting as well. Uh, so we were fortunate. I've been really interested in the notion of trying to create online experiences, complement academic conferences for a few years. And so last year, I ran a bunch of tests, uh, leveraging the live streams that a lot of academic conferences are doing. So we were planning on doing that with VR already. Um, we're using Mozilla Hub's uh, virtual world platform for the, the conference. And so when all of this started to happen, we made the decision last week or two weeks ago two weeks before the conference that we we're gonna shift completely online. And so we're doing that. So we're gonna have talks, panels, uh, poster sessions, demos, such as we can do it, 3D UI contests, social setting sessions, uh, birds of a feather, the whole set of things that we would have done at the conference uh, online. And I think, you know, your comments about the uh, social aspects, the hallway conversations, the casual interaction is what drove me to experiment with virtual worlds for for these conferences right because watching the streams on twitch doesn't give you any opportunity to have those social experiences but if we get you know the i think we've got about as of right now 1200 people registered for vr and if we get them split across rooms of 20 15 20 10 25 people we can have start having these conversations within within groups, pop between rooms, find people you like. But the VR isn't enough, right? So we're also gonna use Slack for conversations and uh, things like Slido and such for trying to collect questions. We're gonna use Zoom for part of the stuff. So we're pulling together tons of technology uh, in order to create something that starts to feel like that. I just wanted to clarify uh, about the platform that you're using, Blair. Uh, mm -hmm. which, which one is it? So we're using Mozilla's Hubs platforms. Yeah, Mozilla so, Hubs lets you pull in all of that other technology? Well, it's web-based, so we'll be streaming video into it using uh, probably Twitch. And uh, we can pull in sort of any web-based stuff. But because, so for people who will be uh, attending in VR, pure VR, which you can do, uh, you'll be immersed in the 3D world, but on the desktop, you can access all of your regular apps and use the, the platform in a, in a you know, 3D in a Windows style. So I think for these sorts of events, I feel we found or I've found that people, the majority of people tend to, who want to be active, tend to do it on the desktop. And, uh, and then especially when you want to have conversations and just watch the talks and so on, being, being in, the, in the VR is actually a lot better. Gotcha. Well, thanks for that. Hi, Jimmy. Nice to e meet you. Hey, Charlie. How are you? Good. Tell, so, tell yeah, us me, a little uh, bit about what you're seeing at BCG. Sure. Um, right. So maybe a quick introduction. I'm um, I'm Jimmy. I'm a partner at the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, here in Thai, uh, in Greater China area. Um, so as James has said, you know, we're, we've been impacted pretty hard, right? And um, you know what? Um, 
what we do usually with our clients is you know we we, we collaborate with them on, on site at client sites usually and that has stopped since i guess early january right um so so in what the clients or companies are coming to us now is actually actually on a few things to see whether uh, BCG has the, um, any, any insights into how to how to uh, help them. Uh, number one is actually on um, business conti continuity, right? Because people don't think about this, um, I guess, uh, in a very holistic way until you know these type of pandemic pandemic happens. Right? So, for instance, you know, banks are now using A B shifts. By, uh, having two buildings, having to rent another building just to make sure that there's some business continuity in case, say, the regular building is uh, infected or for whatever reason, right? Um, and, and you have to now to, to really go and do some inventory check on what are some of the bit of business critical um, critical conditions that you have to you have to avoid, and also uh, what are the contingency plans, right? So that's number one. And number two, actually, um, given that most people are now working from home um, in the region, actually there's some IT challenges as well, right? Because people, uh, you know, a lot of the tasks, uh, like um, you know, the previous panelists have said, really require some face-to-face -face interactions, right? So how do you ha make that happen virtually? Um, or digitally, uh, that's another issue that um, that uh, people or uh, companies are faced with. And lastly, uh, very interestingly, is actually uh, a lot of companies, their, their, their daily behavior is uh, hinged on, okay, sitting in a chair and, and work from nine to five, right? Um, so how do you motivate your, your employee when you can't see them, right? How, how can an employee themselves motiv motivate themselves and, and get the job done? And they're working from home, right? So how do you, I guess, right? So so what are the additional incentives or, or mechanisms that you have to design to make sure that hey, these things happen on a regular basis? That's actually what companies are now coming to us to to to, to discuss. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, uh, continuing to take sort of the the high road and look at the big picture, do you guys think that uh, the crisis represents significant inflection point that will make us change? Our behavior permanently like will business travel never be the same or will we revert to pre-pandemic behavior when the crisis is over well why don't we start with you jimmy we'll go the opposite direction okay um i i um you know i i don't have a crystal ball so i don't know how long the pandemic will last and i think that would be the key drivers on changing people's behavior I, um, I think even at this point, even though the NBA has been shut down and um, all of the, uh, I guess, the, um, even the uh, golf games, the Players' Championship have been shut down, I think most people still perceive this as sort of a short-term sort of anomaly, you know, um, and, and, and will pass, right? But if, what if it goes on for another quarter, right, uh, two quarters, right, then, then companies are now really will be have to, to go and think about, okay, how do I do business? Uh, uh, make money, right? But using a different, say, mechanism, process, or, or, or what have you, right? So, so really, the driver is whether the pandemic itself will be a long-lasting thing that would change the way we live, or is it still sort of a, sh a short-term shock to the system? Right. So, this is uh, remain to be seen. What do you think, Blair? So, I think I think it represents an enormous opportunity to see if the things we might have thought might help with uh, changing behavior will actually work, right? So there was a, there's was there been a lot of discussion in uh, education and in academic conferencing and, and those fields about climate change, about uh, the need for access. Part of the reason I started working on remote access to conference, big reason was climate change, but partly it was sort of accessibility, right? There's billions of people around the world who would love access to the kind of knowledge that we discuss at these conferences, but they can't afford to go to them, can't afford to register for them. Um, whereas uh, now we can we can do these experiments because we're forced to, and people are forced to leap into the unknown. And I think that will go across all sectors. And and you know what I hope is that people will actually embrace the opportunity to to really try things that would work in the long term instead of just sort of limping by with whatever tools might get them through it and it'll be a horrible experience. So I think some things will change. Uh, other things probably won't. Um, as Jimmy said, you know, certain businesses really want and need their employees locally in order to be effective, whereas 
other other people could work effectively from home and might actually realize they like it better, right? Well, let me tell you, as somebody who's worked home from home for 20 years, has its downside. You get very isolated. Things like yep. VR become more important because you want to be present with other people. Yep, yep. I've been on leave from Georgia Tech for four years working at Mozilla and working at home, and I, I, I know what you mean, and it... it it, it is a very different experience being in, a, in an environment like this than being on a video call. Exactly. So, so Andrew, you, you're really in the thick of it. Um, yeah. If, if your conference is effective, really will have lasted for more than a quarter. Uh, yeah, uh, that would be the case. Uh, in all honesty, I think like long term, it, it's somewhere between the two uh, by way of in-person events with a digital event running in tandem. Um, you know, the digital event in tandem has been there. You know, a lot of big shows have like a, a, a live streaming or on-demand video after the event with a l little bit of a networking activity. Um, but there hasn't been historically until now, like really more expansive, much larger events kind of trying to turn their events digital. So, you know, what I've found, um, you know, is that there's not really a replacement for that hallway conversation currently um, or the many interactions and human connections that are made at events that you cannot make digitally um, for, well, I shouldn't say that for everyone, for the, the folks that we target, you know, industrial business users of emerging technology, uh, you need to meet in person. How are you going to try an exoskeleton on an, at a digital event? Uh, there, there really is no replacement for live events in, in my world. Um, so the future events is in, in person with a strong digital version in, in our realm. What um, platform are you going to use for your digital counterpart? Uh, I can't really say that yet. Um, I can probably a few days after the, the, the live event of this takes place. But uh, I, I can elaborate on the, the style. It won't be in VR. Um, we're really focusing on what the attendee um, values from a conference that they attend for, for business professional reasons. Um, so when it comes to that, uh, it's less about the environment that they're in. It's more about the people they're with, the conversations they're having, and the education that they're receiving. Um, so we won't be using a VR platform. Um, it'll be a mix of video, community, a little bit of social networking, and um, a, a digital exhibition. Great. So, James, what's your perspective on uh, the uh, permanence of the changes? I think it's a perm it could be the perm permanent changes, basically. Um, I still can remember like uh, 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 everybody talking about a SaaS was like a 17 years ago in China. So that's a similar situation, the same, uh, but today's I mean, even worse, right? Um, but uh, look at uh, 17 years before, uh, after the SaaS, the biggest change in China is the online, online business booming. Everyone going to the e-commerce and a totally change the behavior of the customer's shopping behavior. I mean, uh, get, getting things done in the e online. And that one helped build up a, a lot of infrastructure services in China, for example, like uh, uh, food delivery, logistical services is quite a uh, cover very well in China now. And this one, uh, the coronavirus uh, did the same thing. And uh, look at the China today. Uh, you, you can see uh, uh, many things like shutdown or, or the cities and lockdown. <clears throat> but the reality is a lot of talks still going on. People buy stuff from online. That's why look at the JD.com. Their business is quite good. Even during the Chinese New Year, they, they mm -hmm. never stop for the delivery. So customer right. buy food, buy stuff, buy many things from online. And also, I mean, uh, even, even schools, the students, they buy, uh, they continue study online. They never stop. So school is still open, but it's online. And the people working, at, uh, working from home, and they still can do, a, do many things, co I mean, cooperatively. Uh, the only thing that probably impact is the factory stuff. So manufacturing, uh, those guys need a physical worker, I mean, right. in the factory to work. They have to be there. Yeah, they have, they have to, to be, be there. 
Yeah, that's a problem. But uh, the, the rest of stuff is still working. Uh, as long as uh, the future, there, uh, there's many technology uh, can change things. I think can technology really and the technology adoption, it's kind of like uh, things need something to push faster. So coronavirus could, could be one of the way or factor to push technology adoption faster or even uh, beyond our expectation. For example, even the VR conference, I think it's the same. VR is perfect, I mean, the technology and the base, uh, based on today's, I mean, the, uh, the infrastructure 5G plus VR plus XR, those things can make a lot of things happen easily. I think uh, the permanent change will be cha will be very fast and change the customer behavior and change the whole technology providers their per uh, perspective as well. Uh, if if the market is going blooming, our technology could be easily adopted and accepted by customer. And a lot of developers, I mean, based on the technology platform, will be easily jump in to help push the ecosystem. I mean, growing faster. That's 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 what I can see. But the all everything perm the permanent change will create a lot of uh, new creative or, or breakthrough of the technologies. I think mm -hmm. this year probably is one of the year we can see many technology company, especially the high tech company, they take the use of the AI for example. For example. Everything's the AI. Look at China, I'm, I'm, I'm impressive about what's happening in China with the AI technology adoption. The robots, you know, deliver a lot of medicines to the patients in the hospital without a doctor there. And I mean, the drones can send, I mean, the send a medicine anywhere. They don't have to get, I mean, the tracks to move in there, right? And, uh, and also, I mean, the, uh, a lot of uh, new ways when I see in, uh, like, uh, in China today, is like, uh, you know, face recognition, right? They use and uh, uh, do a, 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 a gatekeeper. But in the past, they have to show you a, a full face to recognize the person who get in. But now they don't need it. Even you wear the mask, the system can recognize you. And uh, if you go to the elevator, you don't have to touch on the elevator button. You just say you can uh, voice control the system to support you. Well, so I, a lot more may change than just conferences. So I think I think that's a very uh, broad view, James. Thank you for that, Andrew. Uh, wanted to ask you about uh, virtual conferences into in the past as an attendee or? So I, I've attended a, a huge amount uh, recently, but in the past I had attended them here and there and we've been researching a lot of stuff around building digital communities communities for B2Bs just in general at Brain Exchange uh, outside of events. But um, recently, you know, I, I've kind of dove back in to quite a few. And, you know, there, it's, it's still surprising to see, you know, at the end of the day, organizing a conference isn't about the flashy venues, the tech. It's having an, an impeccable layout that enables your attendees, speakers, sponsors, exhibitors, all participants to get value out of the experience. Um, so I found it really interesting that a lot of the digital tools are really focusing on these flashy things um, and not even really thinking about the attendee. Uh, so I found that the most, most platforms are quite clunky, focus heavily on the visual experience instead of really making the correct information available and simple networking experience. Um, being a conference organizer, it's my job to be behind the scenes. You're never going to see me sweat and I want to see everybody, um, you know, getting value out of the experience. Um, so, I, I find these digital events that I'm going to are trying to be the, the attention. Um, and, and I'm basically going to achieve the opposite of that, which is very different than a lot of. Technology gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, technology is amazing. And I completely agree with Jams on so many different levels on everything he just said. However, you know, you're, you're kind of, it, it helps a lot of areas, but I think the, industrial folks, the actual enterprise businesses, the Fortune 1000 for that matter, uh, the ones that aren't selling consumer goods necessarily, 
um, are, are re, they, they can't live without in, in person meetings, whatever way, shape or form that is. Um, like it, it's not possible. How, like you can visualize a, a $5 million piece of equipment, but you're not going to spend $5 million until you see it physically. Yeah, I, I think, so I've, I've gone to, you know, a range of things from meetups to, to uh, some academic stuff that I've run. And, you know, I think, I think Andrew's point that there are, there's a certain class of experiences, right, where you need to see physical things. The demo part of our conference, for example, is not going to be what it would be if it were face-to-face. Um, sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think the, the, the big focus, and in, in, in you pointed out, is, is supporting the social interactions and supporting the things that the attendees are actually there for. Um, at the academic conferences that we go to, there's talks, you know, we can, we can watch them on Twitch, uh, sure, but you're sort of by yourself. Uh, so our, our focus is on, and the focus of a lot of the academic stuff has been on uh, trying to provide opportunities for people to meet each other, talk, talk, and, and so on. Um, and so, and, and I think it's really interesting uh, to think about the context. So I haven't met any, any of you before. And so when you're talking, I'm sort of imagining, you know, from your pictures, what, what your mannerisms are and what you look like. On the other hand, I've had, uh, I had a chat one night for an hour and a half with my, one of my colleagues in Australia because uh, uh, we kept wanting to in, in VR. And even though his avatar didn't look anything like him, uh, when I hear his voice, when I hear him laugh, when I see him gesture the way that I know he does when he's talking, I just pictured him, right? So I think the context yeah. is so important. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that is the thing that's most exciting to me because we can, especially when you've got the scaffolding and you know people already or when you can mix VR and avatars with video and voice chat and so I can see you I can get to know you a little and then we can spend time together I think there's an enormous opportunity and so much of what goes on say at AWE which I've been to a number of times is is the demo but it's also like you know going to the talks and listening and just talking to people so I think a lot of that stuff can easily be be uh, replaced for a lot of people and then instead of how many people were at the last AWE, Andrew? Uh, about 6,000, I believe. Yeah, so imagine it's 70,000, 80,000, 100,000 people. And sure, maybe there's a few thousand that have to come so they can see things, but you can reach enormous audiences. Great. That's all the time we have for our panel this afternoon, or whenever time it is. We're all in different time zones around the world. That actually is kind of the cool thing about this, right, that we can all be really present, even though we're at wildly different times of day and we're distributed all over the world. So, you know, this is pretty mind blowing for me. Anyway, uh, thank you all for your time today and uh, we'll see you in the